The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the hosts and creators of this program. This is the Pet Buzz. This is the Pet Buzz. Freshly collected with news, celebrity pet gossip, and the latest pet trends. The Pet Buzz gives you the latest 411 on everything pet related. Everything pet related. Hosted by pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. And here's the Dynamic Pet Duo. Let's start off the Pet Buzz. Let's start off the show with some great news. We're excited to announce the Pet Buzz can now be heard in Amarillo, Texas on News Talk KGNC AM on 710 and KGNC FM on 97.5. Yep, we're excited to be in Texas. We're excited to be in Texas and we're excited to grow our family, especially in Amarillo, Texas. So big shout out, you know, you got to go big if you're going to be in Texas, right? Isn't we got to be say? big if we we're going to be in Texas. You got it. Is that how they sound in Texas? That's the way they sound. I don't know. I want to hear from you. Is that how they sound in Texas or is Dr. Fleck wrong? So you Texans <laughs> out there, you folks from Amarillo, let us know. Well, now let's kick off the show with the weekly countdown. And in four, in segment four, we're talking with Bridgeport, Connecticut's the Honorable Mayor Joseph Ganim, about his being bitten by a dog on a Delta Airlines flight. Three, in Seg 3, we talk with Susan McKelvey, the Communications Manager at the National Fire Prevention Association, about pets and fires. And two, in Segment 2, I'm dishing about celebrity pet gossip. And I'm talking about Dr. Google and pets. All on Flex Facts. <laughs> And in segment one, as summer temperatures soar, dogs are at risk of potentially fatal heat-related illness, and certain ones appear particularly vulnerable. A large new study confirms this. And joining us today is veterinarian Emily Hall. Dr. Hall currently works at the School of Animal, Rural, and Environmental Sciences, Nottingham Trent University. She teaches veterinary nursing science and has been researching methods of temperature monitoring in dogs, of which she will share with us today. Dr. Hall, thank you for joining us in the Pet Buzz today. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, as climate change has caused global temperatures to rise, do you think we will see more heat-related illnesses in pets as well as in people? Definitely. Um, I think compared to any other animal, dogs really do share our lives. So they live in our homes. They come on walks and cycles and runs with us. Some dogs even come to work. Um, and obviously some dogs even work for a living. You know, police dogs, army dogs, guide dogs for the blind, um, dogs for the hearing and um, emotional support dogs. So the threat that we face as people, our dogs are going to face exactly the same challenging conditions. So as our homes get hotter, um, as our schools and our offices get hotter, as our cars get hotter, it's going to affect our dogs just as much as it affects us. Great, great answer. I'm glad that we're able to ask that question. I think it's really, really important. So Dr. Hall, what breeds of dogs most suffer from heat-related illness or HRI? And why is it so important to know this? Okay, so we looked at UK dogs um, and our studies probably the biggest to date. So we included nearly a million dogs that were being treated by a vet in the UK. So that's roughly 10% of the UK dog population, so pretty big numbers. And in our study, we found that Chow Chows, Bulldogs, French Bulldogs, Dog de Bordeaux, Greyhound, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniels, Pugs, Golden Retrievers and Springer Spaniels all seem to have higher risk than the Labrador. And we picked the Labrador just because it's the most popular breed in the UK and because the Labrador didn't seem to be at any greater risk than your classic kind of mongrel, Heinz 57. Um, So we know that there are some breeds that are developing heat stroke more frequently than other breeds. And the vast majority of those breeds are snub-nosed, I think you guys call it. We say (laughs) (laughs) flat-faced. Yeah, breeds without a nose basically. And it really does come down to how dogs cool. So dogs are totally different to people in that they don't functionally sweat. So when you or I are a bit hot, you know, you get slightly 
sweaty, <laughs> as lovely as that is. And that's how we cool as people. Dogs can't sweat over the vast majority of their surface to cool down. So they have to pant. And the way panting works is that the, the fluid within the nose then evaporates and that takes heat with it. So the shorter your nose is, the less surface area you have to pant basically and the less heat you can lose so your short nosed dogs literally just their panting's not as effective it doesn't cool them as much as a you know a dog with a great big long nose like normally greyhound ironic um but the other issue with your snub nosed dogs is that they they have to work to breathe many of them so not only do they have a really short nose but they also have a narrowed airway so if you can imagine trying to breathe through a straw and how much effort that takes to suck the air into your lungs and blow it back out again. That's using energy. That's using muscles to, to power that breathing. And those muscles are generating heat. And you can get to the point where your flat faced dog is using more energy and generating more heat trying to pant than they're actually losing through the panting. So they just get hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, and, and that really is why they are so at risk. You know, my next question is going to be about other dogs or dogs having certain health conditions can be at risk too, but does the thickness of the coat have anything to do with this too? We're not sure is the honest answer. Possibly. The coat's a really interesting one because a coat can provide a little bit of protection because it's insulation. So if the dog is just sitting, just sunbathing, then potentially the coat is actually protecting them a little bit from a very hot environment. But the moment they start doing some exercise, then that, you know, it's it's like going for a run with a thermal jacket on in the middle of the summer. Then, yes, quite possibly a thick coat is going to cause them to overheat quicker. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we clip horses when they need to work through the winter um, so that they don't overheat. So, yes, but you're right. Other health conditions can definitely put dogs at risk. So any dog with a breathing issue, anything that narrows their airway, anything that makes it difficult for them to pant and breathe effectively is going to reduce their ability to cool and make the heat more dangerous. And I would even think that with a heart condition. I mean, you mentioned Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, dogs that yep. notoriously have heart conditions. So I would think that would be par for the course. Well, if you've just joined us, we're speaking with veterinarian Dr. Emily Hall of Nottingham Trent University discussing heat-related illness in dogs. You know, I'm just curious, some of the basic things people always want to know when they look at these studies. Does sex of a dog make a difference? Did more males or females suffer from HRI? And did neutering or spaying have an impact? So in this first study, no, we didn't find any significant difference between males and females or between neutered and non-neutered dogs. But it's a little bit of a spoiler, but we have another study hopefully coming out later this year that explores heat-related illness in more depth. So we look at the risk factors for the different types of heat-related illness. So whether the dog developed it in a car, whether they delivered it undergoing exercise, or whether they were just in a really hot environment. And yeah, we have found some differences between males and females there. But I can't say what until that study has been published, I'm afraid. No worries. But I have to admit, it's only the English who always lead with the spoiler. You never hear <laughs> Americans talking about you know, spoiler alerts, mm. right, Dr. Fleck? Just in athletics. See, it's the difference between people across the pond. Cultures. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a side bit. So let's get back to the interview. Sorry for that. So, Dr. Hall, you know, if your pet shows signs of having HRI or heat-related illness, what should a pet owner do? Get them out of whatever the hot condition is and start cooling them. Use cool water to cool them. Um, don't put things over them because that can trap heat. So, you know, pour buckets or a hose pipe is perfect. Get them to a vet as soon as possible so that they can start treating them effectively. We shouldn't put them in any ice, right? Ice is best for people and horses, but we don't know with dogs. So tap water is perfect. That's what's going to cool them the quickest. Well, great. This was a great interview. Thank you. When will your new study be ready? Uh, we are hoping in the next month or so. We're hoping to publish it in animals and it will be open access. And as soon as it gets released, it will be on our blog, heatstroke.dog. And no doubt there'll be another press release associated with it. Okay. Yeah. Keep us on your mailing list. We'd love to have you back. Okay. Magic. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.
You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We would love to communicate with you via social media. Use the Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. What would you do with two and a half more years with your dog? Two and a half more years of fetch, of walks, of love. Studies show that overweight dogs live two and a half years less on average than dogs at a healthy weight. But Slim Paws is here to help. Veterinarian recommended weight loss in one daily chew for your dog. Slim Paws for the long, healthy life of your dog. Warmer temperatures mean more time outside. You have sunscreen for yourself, but what about Fido? According to the American Animal Hospital Association and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, pets need sunscreen too. I love two things, sports and my dog Chester. Where I go, he goes. To the beach, to play soccer, everywhere. We spend a lot of time together in the sun, so I always carry a can of EpiPet sunscreen. So Chester is protected from the sun's harmful UV rays. I just spray it on and I don't have to worry. Chester is protected, so I know my sports buddy is going to be with me for a long time. Thanks, EpiPet. Use EpiPet Sun Protector, the only FDA-approved pet sunscreen on short-haired, light-colored, hairless, golden retrievers, and other dogs susceptible to skin cancer. Contained in a sports bottle, EpiPet allows you to turn the bottle upside down, making it easier to spray your dog all over to protect your dog from the sun all day and every day. Visit epi-pet.com. Thank you so much for joining the Pet Buzz. This show is hosted by the Pet Dynamic Duo. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. Let's start our celebrity pet news gossip segment about Ryan Seacrest. Well, Ryan Seacrest has American Idol creator Simon Fuller to thank for introducing him to his beloved dog, the Black Labrador named Georgia. It seems that last Thursday, the Live with Kelly and Ryan host revealed that Fuller raises Labradors, and after seeing Ryan playing with his pups at the Fuller home, he decided to gift his friend with a pup as a first step into daddyhood. Ryan revealed that he had never had a dog of his own, but enjoyed many dogs via past relationships. Georgia, who has been with him since 2014, is the first dog that he actually has owned himself. Well, hey, she's used to taking heat. Kim Kardashian took another shot for Instagramming a picture of her daughter North with her Friesian horse. The Kardashian West Ranch in Wyoming has 14 of these beautiful and rare horses. Just a little note, these horses cost anywhere from about seven k to $600,000. Well, Kim received lots of comments about this particular photo, which I'm going to post on our social media channels. Comments for this post included, the money you paid to buy one of these horses could have fed one or two families of four for a whole year. 50 plus people could have eaten, but yay, you had to have 13 extra horses. Okay. Another comment included, honestly, the fact that you chose a moment in time when our unemployment rate is the highest it's ever been since the Great Depression to brag about having too many fancy horses and then couldn't even spell the breed correctly is a perfect illustration of America in 2020. Now, here's what I have to say. If you share your life on social media, to the extent the Kardashians do, you have to expect some criticism. Oh, and P.S., you all know that Kanye, her husband, Kim Kardashian's husband, is running for president again. Wait, Wait, what? Oh, anyway, I just want to know, do you guys think these comments are fair? Okay, also in the news is Leave Schreiber. I just happen to be in love with him. He's my celebrity crush. Schreiber stars in Ray Donovan. And back in the day, he didn't live too far from me in Soho in New York City. That was pre-Ray Donovan. And he used to take his kids to the chocolate shop across the street from my home. His kids loved my dog, especially my golden retriever, Hannah. And I used to bring my dogs out to see the family when they were at the chocolate shop. So fast forward, his dog, Woody, 
got hit by a car not so long ago. Now, if you recall, he adopted Woody and his sister off the Live with Kelly and Ryan show. And there was an adoptable dog segment about dog rescue post-Hurricane Harvey. He kept Woody and he gave the dog sister to Naomi Watts and their kids. Well, Leaf just got another pooch named Scout from Toby's Small Dog Rescue. I must say the dog's really cute. I'm going to share his picture. That's Toby's picture on our social media channels. And really about Woody's passing, Leaf wrote on Instagram, it was all over fairly quickly and I don't think he suffered too much. I just wish I could have said the same for us. You know, that's my guy. It sounds like he was probably there when the dog got hit by a car. I just love him. And I just want you all to remember, keep your dog on a leash at all times attached to you, even if he's in the front yard of your house. I don't want what happened to Leaves dog happen to your pooch. I want you to keep your pets safe, not only this summer, but at all times. And now let's move forward with Flex Facts. Welcome to Just the Facts. Just the Facts. Fact or fiction? Just the Facts, ma'am. You want answers! I want the truth! It's going to take long. You got the time. What is the topic for today? Okay. DrGoogle.com. But for pets. Okay, I gotcha. Okay, so why are people turning to Dr. Google for pet care advice or pet health advice? Well, if your pet's not feeling well and you want to know what's wrong, because we live in a digital age, pet owners take their pet issues straight to Dr. Google. Now, let me just say that that can either be, for diagnostic purposes for the veterinarian, either a nightmare or it can be partially helpful. Well, we recognize it's easy. You can do it any time of the day. And? It's convenient. And? It doesn't cost money. There you go. It doesn't that's, cost money. That's a primary a motive question. for okay. for most people when, they, when they're looking for information about their pet's health. Okay. So we live this digital lifestyle kind of life with the phones, with the information. So what's wrong with Dr. Google and, and his advice? Well, unfortunately, sites dishing out pet medical opinions aren't always very trustworthy at all. Okay. Online symptom checkers rarely provide the correct diagnosis on their first try. So many pet sites were also found to give people bad information about when and where to seek veterinarian's advice. Okay. So while it may be tempting to use these tools to find out what may be causing your symptoms... Most of the time, they are unreliable at best and can be dangerous at worst. Okay, so here's what I'm going to say to kind of pull this in. So why don't you give me an example of what you're talking about? Like, let's say a dog has an ear infection. So if your dog has an ear infection, it's a common problem in pets. One of the top problems in pets, medicine for care. So many sites tell you to use apple cider, and other vinegars for ear infections. But there's current research which indicates that ACV for ear infections can be harmful. So additionally, ear infections can be very painful. Mm -hmm. And remember that about your pet. The reason why you're concerned is because you want them to be healthy and feel good, not feel badly. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're treating it with inappropriate or if you leave it untreated, it can cause more damage than what you really want to have happen to your pet. So I know money's tight, especially now, but seeing your vet is always a better choice than having an in-house call with Dr. Dr. Google. Google. (laughs) Anything else? Yeah, I'd like to give you at least two websites that if you are going to seek out information, go to either WebDVM or... Or go to the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association's website. It's avma.org. Okay. That's all the Flex Facts for this week. Very informative. Right on. Spot on, Dr. Flex. Spot on. Spot on. Okay. More of the pet buzz very soon. So we're going to take a commercial break. And up next, my I Like You of the Week. Stay tuned. We love sharing. Pet advice, pet expertise. Something I do every day.
Teva Pet knows there's a lot in your life that you worry about. We want to make sure your pet's flea and tick protection isn't one of them. Teva Pet offers vet quality flea and tick protection that has the same active ingredients as leading brands like Canine Advantix 2 and Frontline Plus, but that cost much less, which means you can give your pet total flea protection worry free. And the best part is you can get Teva Pet flea and tick topicals delivered right to your door when you shop on TevaPet.com. Teva Pet, helping you and your pet live your best life. I used to move a lot, but then one day the human said I could stay. They say a lot of words like no and don't chew on that. And sometimes brother and sister get mad at me for pulling their tail or biting their ears. But at the end of the day, when I snuggle up with Mr. Piggy, it's good to know I have a home. Make a dog's day. Adopt. Welcome back. You are listening to the Pet Buzz, the best in pet talk radio. I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. And I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. That's the way it has to be because that's the way I like it. It's genius. I like it. I love it so much. I like it. It's to die for. I like it. I love my I likeies of the week because I can cover products, I can cover news. So this week I'm going to cover a little news tidbit. As you know, that in a presidential election year, there's always a push to get people to register to vote. So for one Atlanta family, things got a little feline freakish, almost outright ghoulish. So when Ron Timms said he checked his mail last Wednesday, he found a voter registration application addressed to Cody Timms, his cat who passed away 12 years ago. The Tims, who have a great and dry sense of humor, posted the information on Facebook, and then their muse got picked up by media outlets, old friends, and others they haven't seen in 10 to 30 years. So Ron's wife, Carol, told WAGA-TV that Cody was a great cat, indoor and outdoor, loved his family, loved his neighborhood. He was 18 and a half when he passed away. Carol wasn't sure why they were trying to register cats, other animals like dogs and mice and snakes to register the vote, but who knows why. But according to news outlets who checked with the Secretary of State's office, it said that the application did not come from its office and that third-party groups often use mailing lists to get the names and addresses of potential voters to register. Well, third-party groups all over the country are targeting Georgia to help register qualified individuals, the Secretary of State's office said in a statement. This group makes you wonder what these out-of-town activists are really doing. Make no mistake about it, this office is dedicated to investigating all types of fraud. Well, furthermore, the Secretary of State's office said it's quite sure that even if Cody were still alive, and showed up for the polls. Can you imagine a cat showing up to vote? He wouldn't be allowed to vote since he doesn't have a license or state ID. So when I called the Tims on Monday afternoon, I talked to Carol and I asked her how a third party could have possibly gotten Cody's name and address. And she told me there was a phone listed number under the cat's name. Okay. Why? For their daughters when they were teens as a way to protect them. So lastly, if you're wondering how Cody would have voted if he could go to the polls, all I'm going to say is I was told that he would vote demo cat. That's a great story. Don't read into the politics. Just appreciate the story for what it is. And it's a great story. So let's move on with our next guest. I'm bring her on air. National Pet Fire Safety Day takes place on July 15th. And even though we missed the date and passed the holiday, I still want to take some time to go over some fire safety pet tips that can prevent fires in our home and keep our pets safe should a fire break out. And joining us is Susan McKelvey, the communications manager at the National Fire Protection Association. That's the NFPA. So, Susan, welcome to the Pet Buzz Show today. Thank you for having me. So, Susan, can you tell us about how many fires are animals responsible for each year? Sure. So, we know that about 800 um, fires are involve animals each year, which includes pests, 
and wildlife. Okay. That's an interesting statistic, don't you think, Dr. Fleck? I sure do. I think that's really interesting. And maybe what are some of the examples of the fires that pets start? I guess pets and wildlife. Yeah, pets and wildlife. Yeah. So, um, so cooking is a leading, or cooking equipment, I should say. Animals are involved in um, a lot of fires that involve cooking equipment. So we obviously know in the kitchen there's a likelihood of pets getting involved in fires. Other things include lamps or some sort of lighting getting knocked over, fires and chimney places, wiring or related equipment, and also heating and candles. So all those things combined are the factors. Okay. That make up so for example, fires. and we've seen this in one of those insurance commercials, somebody leaves the pizza box with the pizza on it on the stove, the dog jumps up, <laughs> and then he turns the knob and the pizza box catches on fire. Boom. Okay, another one right. is the cat chews the computer cords and a whole bunch of other cords, and bam. But what about wildlife? I mean, what are they, the wildlife getting stuck in the flute and the chimney flute? I mean. Yeah, that's exactly it. So that's one of the things. So they might make nests um, um, in or near chimneys or in dryer or exhaust vents or other warm places. And then the other thing you want to consider is rodents need to chew so they can cause hidden damage to wiring in your home or your car. So you have to be really careful, you know, about making sure that um, there aren't wires exposed or that if you have um, rodents, a rodent problem, that like you have an electrician inspecting your home and making sure you seal up places where they could get in. Okay. And I'm sure that happens a lot in the fall when it gets cool, mm-hmm. when the wildlife, exactly especially right. rodents, are coming into the home. Well, if you've just joined us, we're talking with Susan McKelvey, the communications manager for the NFPA.org about pets and house fires. So how can we prevent pets from starting fires? So I always say for any type of fire, you know, you really want to just be aware of when they can, when and where they can happen. So like we were talking about, in the kitchen while you're cooking, if you're using candles, if you've got space heaters going or lamps on, you really need to be aware of the fact that you're, pets inside are roaming in around your house and that they have to stay well away from cooking equipment or candles that are in use. So keep pets, you know, we say a minimum of three feet away from anything that can burn. So you want, when you're cooking, when you're using space heaters, if you've got candles, make sure that pets aren't anywhere near them. You know, even the fireplace and Dr. Fleck, because you put our cat Hayden out before, Hayden climbed up on the table, right, and caught fire from a burning from the candles. From a candle. So imagine mm-hmm. a cat on fire running around mm. your house. Mm. Also during, I mean, yep. it's the summertime, but imagine the cat so close to the fireplace. Yeah. So and, right, and people do use candles here around too. So if a cat jumps on a counter and you've got a candle going. That can be a hazard, which is a reason that we really encourage people to use battery-operated flameless candles because they look and smell like can't real candles, but obviously you eliminate the risk there. So, Susan, tell us, how can we keep our pets safe? Obviously, other than the <laughs> flameless candles. Right, and then so for cooking equipment, you know, when you're in your kitchen cooking, don't leave it unattended. And that goes for, you know, whether you've got pets or your kids or you're by yourself. You really want to keep a close eye on what you're cooking. Um, so that you can carefully monitor the situation. You know, animals can, you know, if you have a cat or a dog, they can bump into appliances if there's a pot handle. So you want to make sure pot handles are pushed in so they can't come in contact or knock them. And then, again, you just want to make sure that if, as best as you can, keep them well away from the area. And then when if you have to leave the room, turn off the heat source. Yeah, and here's some other things that you should think about. Covering your cords. So if you have a puppy or a kitten who likes to chew, cover those cords so they can't chew through them. Also, I didn't know this one, and I got this one off your website today. So if you're going to be leaving, you're going to work, and you keep your pet, keep your pet in an area near the front door so that firefighters know if they open your door that there's a pet there should a fire start in your house. Because most fires don't start by the front door. They start in the kitchen. They start in the dryer area. And right. the other thing is make sure you have your stickers on the door that says how many pets. Maybe leave a note on the back of the door like I do, where your pets would hide. Yeah, if you do have a fire in your home and you have pets inside, you know, you can alert the fire department that the pets are in there and where you think they are, which kind of brings us to another, it's a tough message to hear, especially to say on a, a pet show, but... At NFPA, our first priority is people safety. So we love pets. We are pet owners ourselves. 
you know, in a fire situation, your first priority is getting yourself and your family members out. All the firefighters go through a process where they have to uh, go through the plans of how to conduct themselves during a fire. We should do the same things, correct? So we should have an evacuation plan. Yeah, you know, advanced planning is the key because in a fire situation, it's too late to start making those plans and you're not, you're scared. It's a situation you've probably never been in in your life and you're not really necessarily thinking in the best terms. So that is a key to planning not only for your pets, but for yourself and, you know, your loved ones who you live with. Susan, thank you so much for joining us on the Pet Buzz today. Well, thank you for having me. This is great. To learn more about pets, fires, and prevention, visit nfpa.org. Stay tuned. Up next is Global Pet News. Got to get more of that buzz, more of that pet buzz right here with Dr. Fleck and myself. Looking forward to it. You are listening to the Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We would love to communicate with you via social media. Use the Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. Does your pet have dry, flaky, and itchy skin? Do you find yourself visiting the veterinarian repeatedly because Fido or Fluffy has skin allergies or ear infections? EpiPet to the rescue. Developed by a veterinarian, EpiPet is a revolutionary, high-performance skin and ear care product line made with the finest natural ingredients. EpiPet, for you and your pet, means better pet health. For more information, visit epi-pet.com. I'm petrinologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We are urban, suburban, and and country. country. Let's kick off the segment with some global pet news. And now, pet buzz news from around the globe. An Escambia County, Florida man is now facing charges for leaving his dog inside a hot car in a Walmart parking lot last Sunday, according to a sheriff's report. Thank goodness the dog did not die. So Brian Brown, 30 years old, is charged with animal cruelty. The incident happened last Sunday afternoon, as I said, in the Walmart in Pensacola. The report states that deputies received a call for a dog under duress in a vehicle. Upon arrival, deputies saw three of the four car windows cracked. The dog inside was heavily panting, according to the report. Deputies said it was 91 degrees outside at the time of the incident with 101 heat index. Okay, the report also stated a deputy took the dog out of the car and gave him water in the patrol vehicle. The dog reportedly had a temperature of 102.5, which I have to tell you the truth is in the normal range for a dog. At the height, at the top of the normal range, but it's still in the normal range. Brown told deputies, now he's the owner, told deputies that he'd only been in the store for 10 minutes. However, the report states surveillance video shows it had been nearly an hour. Animal control arrived and took the dog. Hooray! Dogs left in hot cars matter. So please don't leave your dog in a hot car this summer. We wouldn't want them to suffer or you to get in trouble for doing something really stupid. Okay, well, our next guest is on the phone. So let's get on with the third interview for the show. So dogs being lost on flights, ending up in Japan, giant bunnies dying on flights. Remember Simon from the UK being shipped to the US? Cats self-packing in their owner's luggage. A French bulldog ends up in an overhead compartment. Chihuahuas causing planes to land prematurely. And now a city mayor is suing an airline over a dog bite. Joining us today is Bridgeport, Connecticut's mayor, Joseph Ganim. Welcome to the Pet Buzz, Your Honor. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all you do. Great way to uh, get awareness out there. So let's dig right in. What happened on that Delta Airlines flight from November of 2018? Yeah, I mean, simply put, I was bit by a dog that shouldn't have been roaming um, out of its crate on the plane. Probably shouldn't have been on the plane at all. 
a dog with that temperament. And I'm a dog lover, by the way. My daughter just got a brand new, beautiful golden retriever puppy. So we have a little bit of fun with it as a family. But, you know, this was not a good situation. No one should be put in that situation, nor should the dog. Where were you sitting? Whatever, whatever right, normal class is. Uh, normal class. Okay, is coach. Plane, so. Yeah, coach. Um, we weren't really at the sitting stage yet because we were boarding the plane. Okay. And so uh, apparently the dog owner was on the like, board of the plane, but was on ahead of me, was in an aisle seat that ended up being two or three rows ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So as I passed, there was a dog. The crate looked like it was either on the seat or on the floor. I can't remember, under the front seat. But the dog was on the floor, on the ground, okay. on the floor of the plane. Uh, I didn't think there was a leash on him. And uh, he, uh, he growled and jumped out as I walked by and uh, nipped my bit or nipped my, my, my leg, my left leg as I went by. Now, through my jeans. And you know, I felt it. And, you know, I think I maybe got bit by a dog once. I can't remember when I was a kid. But, you know, it was an uncomfortable feeling. It wasn't like, oh, my God, I, you know, I fell to the ground. But it was not a good thing. And um, so I, I found my seat. It was two seats back. And I sat down. And I pulled up my jeans. And I saw it. You know, it was already starting to, whatever it does, Bleed. turn color. And uh -huh. you could see it. It took a closed look and could see broken the skin. And I'm watching. And can't remember. He growled at at least one other passenger, and he growled at a three-year-old girl who ended up sitting next to me as well with her mom. Okay. Um, and so, so, and the dog was still out, and I said to the lady, I said, look, you really need to put, you know, your dog in, in the crate. He bit me, and he's growling at people. She just seemed to be kind of oblivious to what was going on. And I don't even know if she ignored, I think she ignored me. I, I took it as ignoring me because she did not respond. She did not answer. She didn't, she just kind of went about her. And in fairness to her, um, I'm not sure English was her first language. She was European. Okay. And uh, my guess is she's European. I don't, if I'm wrong, I apologize to her. But um, so maybe she didn't understand. But I did clearly tell her, I said, look, you, you put your dog, it's not safe. Put him in, in the, the container. That so did they tell you this was, was this quote unquote like a service dog? Did you see a vest on the dog or was it a pet? No vet, no vest. I don't recall any vest okay. on the dog. Um, I think she wanted to, I think she was claiming it was a, you say service dog. Maybe that's the right term. Right. This is not, I don't want anybody to think this is someone who takes care of someone who can't see. This is not that type of high sure. caliber dog for someone who needs assistance. This was just like, this was just her pet. Generally what you have is you have emotional support dogs and you also have service yeah, dogs. I think now, that's the right term. That right. They were trying so to I'm a diabetic. I flat when, you know, when we don't have COVID-19, I do lots of TV all over the country. Everybody knows who listens to the show. I do a lot of Fox TV all over the country. I travel with a diabetic alert dog. I actually have a large one. I have a golden retriever. She's so big. I can't travel with her anymore. Because she's so big, she wants to <laughs> sprawl to over travel. the three. Right, she's great. I mean, and kids run up, and I, yeah. you know, parents get upset, but I can't let people pet her. And then I have a smaller, mm -hmm. older dog who I retired out. I have to take him with me sometimes now because his replacement is not accurate. Uh, like, he's only accurate maybe 40 or just 50% of the time. So I still use my old dog, you know, most days when I travel. You know, travel can be stressful, and I'm sure... You know, you were thinking about, you know, getting in your seat, getting comfortable. And, you know, obviously there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it was around Christmas time. There's lots of things going on in municipalities. I mean, let's face it, you're a mayor. You're a busy man. So I'm sure, you know, you had lots of things going on in your mind. I, I, forgot, I even forgot to ask you where you're going. But so obviously you sat down and you were kind. I mean, most people would have been screaming right then and there, calling for this, you know, the flight attendant. Um, and the fact that this lady... I mean, you know, let's face it. Dogs are kind of like kids. You kind of know how bad your kid is, and you kind of know secretly how bad your pet is. I mean, you know, that that's why we call them pet parents, everybody. So, I mean, I'm surprised that at that particular point, the flight attendant didn't didn't ask to get you medical treatment. You know, like stop everything, you know call you the captain, and get I you. Show her. No, you make a good point. She did not. Look, I looked at it. You know, sometimes you think you're, I was really concerned when he growled as a three-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because Dr. Fleck, he's not here right now, but, you know, one of the things we always talk about or he deals with on a day-to-day -day basis when people come into the practice, they want to know 
you know, what shots they need or what paperwork they need. And a lot of times people don't want to get paperwork. They want to scam and get their dog on board on these planes. And, you know, the airlines have recently changed the rules. About two years ago in 2018, they changed the rules so that the dog status is clearly defined in what you need. You need to have paperwork. You need to have letters from your veterinarian or dog trainer, depending on if it's a service dog or it's an emotional support dog. People register their dogs as emotional support dogs because they don't want to pay the fee. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Fees to travel with your dog via plane are expensive. Sometimes they're actually, for a round-trip ticket, for a dog, it's more expensive than a person. So a lot of people have tried to scam, but there have been so many incidents like this, and they had to reroute the plane, land in the nearest airport, um, and that passenger at that particular point got off the plane. But I'm, I'm glad that you came on to share your story because this faux service dog, this pet parent behavior, this pet owner behavior is just, it, you know, it's like one bad apple ruins it for all of us. Um, we said that one bad, one bad dog owner ruins it for all the good dogs that are out there that we all love and we want to travel with. Mayor, I'm going to let you go. I know how busy you are. Please thank your staff for me. And like I said, I'm going to call you in a few months, probably right before Labor Day, and find out where we are with this case, okay? Thanks so much. It was great to be on. Best to you and your listeners. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. So where does the time go, Dr. Fleck? Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. It's that, it's that time. It's that time to wrap the show. But before we go, we want to give you a preview for next week's show. So next week, we're going to talk about dogs with cataracts, dating apps geared toward cat owners. And of course, there's always more. Special thanks to our guests, Dr. Emily Hall, Susan McKelvey, and Mayor Joseph Gannum. Great. And, of course, we must always thank our sponsors, the Animal Medical Center of Bradenton and EpiPet, making better skin-coated ear care products for healthier pets everywhere. And if you have any questions, just write us at teen at thepetbuzz.com. We'll cover it next week's show. And if you've missed any portion of this show, visit our social media channels as well as your favorite streaming channels and listen to the Link Podcast on Monday morning. But most importantly, remember, we're here each week to help you take better care of your pets. Peace out and pet love. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pet Buzz. The Pet Buzz is hosted by the dynamic pet duo, pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. Tune in each week for the latest 411 on everything pet related. Visit our website at www.thepetbuzz.com. Learn more about us, the show, and our guests.